Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Nurcia Tener. Uh, welcome to Bastia's to the first episode of the season. Uh, I would like to say a few words about Bastia's for those who never been with us before. Um, Bastia's Histories of Cyprus is an independent public history project. Each month we showcase work that brings a fresh and exciting perspective on the past and bring you, the audience and listeners, in direct contact with the people who research and tell the histories of Cyprus. Uh, we welcome people of all different genders, identities, ethnicities, ages, and faiths. And if you would like to join our team or support our work, you can find us on Facebook or Instagram or send us an email at bastiashistorycy at gmail.com. Uh, in this episode, Pastures editor Dr. Maria Yorgo talks to Marios Epeminandas. Uh, and now I'm going to pass on to our editor Maria. Thank you. Hello from, uh, from me as well. Um, it's with uh, great pleasure that um, I do the, the first episode for Pastures Histories of Cyprus for 2022 20, uh, 23. Um, this is the second year we are running, 33 count the pilot. Um, so far we have been uh, hosting discussions like the one you are attending today. We also had a hybrid event which we are looking forward to um, uh, repeat, so do more things in, in person. Um, we would like to, um, I would like to point out that this is the work of, uh, of many people uh, to whom I would like to make a quick uh, reference uh, later. Um, a few housekeeping uh, rules. So um, this episode is being recorded. So if you don't feel um, comfortable with um, uh, your face or your name, like staying on the screen, uh, please switch off your camera or um, change your name. Um, this is an open space. We want to create a community. So uh, we would like to ask you to write comments on the chat. Where do you come from or uh, where you are attending from? Um, maybe what do you do so as to understand um, uh, who you are and think of, of subjects that uh, can broaden up the discussion. Um, also, since this is uh, about creating a community and pushing further the discussion, I would like to make reference to our blog and what we have been calling um, reflection pieces. So each month we are asking one of you, one of the attendees to write a personal piece about the episode. Um, so if you like this episode, if it speaks to you in any way, uh, please, to please do contact us. Um, you can uh, go to our blog and, and see what our reflection uh, pieces. Um, we think the beauty of what we do is that we op open up the space. So for different people to take different things from this. Um, having said that, as Noor said, uh, we want to be a safe space, a space for everyone. So uh, we won't tell, tolerate any hate speech or any behavior that is discriminating against uh, anyone. Uh, so please do have that in mind, both uh, during your comments in the chat and, and during the Q&A. Um, now, our episode. Um, we wanted to start the season with something exciting, something that everyone loves. And we know that everyone loves Marius and his walks. So we said, okay, let's use these walks to speak about Nicosia and to speak about Nicosia in context, to take what we see um, and also imagine the people uh, in, uh, around the buildings, between the buildings, in the space. Um, this is this is often missing when we walk around or when we have um, um, walks. We see buildings, we see monuments. We say when they were built, but we are often missing the people. So we want to bring in the people today. Um, we've called this a virtual walk because we will ask Marius, who knows how to do this best, to walk us through Nicosia, through its different phases. Um, so we will be walking virtually together, seeing, smelling hearing. Um, for those of you who don't know Mario Sepaminondas, I would like to um, say a few words about who he is. Uh, Mario Sepaminondas has studied pedagogics, history, art history, and educational leadership. He has worked as a teacher, museum animator, history textbook author, teacher trainer, and education policy expert. 
Uh, he's among the founding members of the Association for Historical Dialogue and Research, and he's been active in the civil society organizations since the mid 90s at both a local and international uh, level. He has been a coordinator and trainer in several projects relating to history education, but also human rights education and intercultural uh, learning and citizenship. Marius believes in the capacity of people to be agents of change in their societies, and he's always ready to be engaged in efforts which could facilitate um, this endeavor. Since uh, 2010, he has developed an activity known as the Nicosia Walk. Nicosia Walk is a city tour or anti-tour, it depends on how you see it, uh, aiming to help participants enhance their understanding of the Cypriot capital city through a multi-perspective approach. So without further ado, let's start. Um, Maria, welcome to Bakhtia's Histories of Cyprus. Hello, Maria. Thank you for inviting me. Hello to all the people who are attending. And I hope that we will have, I don't know, an interesting evening, let's say. I'm sure we will uh, We will have. So, Maria, let's uh, start. Well, please. it's very easy and very, yeah, yeah. It's very easy and it's very pleasant for me to talk about Nicosia. So for me, I think it will be a nice event or also to hear about Nicosia or to discuss about Nicosia, so yeah. Um, absolutely, because one of the things we want to do is to also listen and discuss and um, think things further. So, Maria, let's start from these walks. Um, when did you start them and why did you start them? Why did you start doing these walks? Well, uh, chrono chronologically speaking, uh, I started doing this activity, let's say, officially, because, I mean, there is no official activity, but uh, I started doing this consciously in a way in 2010. But before that, there were some events that uh, inspired me to do them, to start this kind of activity. I will refer to them very briefly because I think it makes sense and it also gives uh, some kind of a context to this uh, a project or effort. Uh, I'm a, as you said, I'm a member of the Association for Historical Dialogue and Research. Possibly people who are attending know about the association. I would, I would like to highlight that it's a very special uh, association. It's a special NGO based in Cyprus. It has members across the divide from many communities, all the communities. And also it has this special interest in history, history teaching and learning, public history. So it has this special character and for the people who, for the people who have created it and also the people who are participating in, in its activities. It's also a big learning experience to be part of a group that transcends some traditional boundaries that we have in Cyprus. This worked for me also. So it was, I think, 2005, six, we had this project with some colleagues in the association. Our aim was to create some educational material that would be available for teachers. <clears throat> and the idea was to have as a center of these activities, Nicosia. And my comment in the, on this is that for us people, I mean Cypriot, people who have been educated in Cyprus, we went through all stages of education from primary school to university. Uh, we, I mean, we know that the history of Cyprus is at the periphery of the mainstream teaching curriculum. And I mean, more specifically, the history of a particular city in Kosia is at the periphery. So we are living in an environment that we don't, technically we are not supposed to research about it or know about it. If we are an everyday person, I'm not talking about people who have a special, I mean, researchers who go and study about the project. So we wanted to give the opportunity to teachers to have some material so they could use and uh, organize uh, site visits. 
I mean, having a site visit is also a good way of providing, I mean, teaching and helping learners to learn. Yeah, so this activity was eventually, at least for me, it was a big learning experience itself because we had to do some research about Nicosia and it uh, revealed some very interesting characteristics. Personally, back then with a couple of other colleagues, we engaged with the uh, creation of material uh, related to the area near Paphos Gate. And indeed, it was very revealing. I mean, what I what we found out there, which is technically obvious, but then uh, if you don't pay enough attention or you, you don't uh, learn how to decipher the earthbound fabric and translate it into uh, documents or accounts from the past. And or illustration about the life of people who were there in earlier years and even today, then things who, who have who, which has obvious. I mean, technically, it's obvious, they are obvious. They are invisible at the same time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this is the background. So, and I, I conclude with this final, let's say, paragraph. Uh, so when I experienced this, I wanted to share what I have learned or what I have seen or what I have had experience with friends and colleagues. And uh, it was mouth by mouth. Uh, what happened was people was telling to each other that we went for a walk with Marios in the city and it was nice. And then people were saying, let's do it again. I will bring my kumbaros or whatever, my girlfriend or my cousin from whatever, from the Limassol. And then this one thing brought another thing. And for me, it was also a challenge to organize it a bit better. Because apart from the uh, aspect of sharing some kind of knowledge or uh, bringing to the forward some questions, it's also there are some technical issues. Because in principle, I wanted to organize these works across the divide. So there are specific places from where you can cross, and there is some kind of time constraints. So this is, let's say, the beginning of this concept, sharing some kind of knowledge or experience with people of my closer circle, which was expanding. Yeah. And then reflecting on it somehow and trying to do it to, to bring it to another level or to cover some other dimensions of the city. Um, Maria, I think what you've said about your works describes exactly how it works. Like I think uh, those of us who have been attending have been invited by others. And then in turn, we invite people who are new and, uh, and so on. Um, also, I don't know if I've ever shared with you this information. The, the Paphos Gate is also one of my favorite areas because my grandfather's coffee shop, Spitfire, is there. And your grandfather's? Not, yes, he was not the last uh, owner before yeah. 74, the second last. Uh, yeah, so it's one of my favorite areas. Uh, now, unfortunately, Spitfire is collapsing. But um, so let's go to Old Nicosia, Old Quarters, as we call them in the title, to start our visual walk and start seeing around us. Um, how big are what we would be calling old quarters? Um, how long would it take to um, uh, walk through this uh, area? How would you define the old quarters or old Nicosia? Well, uh, I, I wouldn't advise anybody to walk through the quarters of Nicosia in one day or in one go. Huh? So, I mean, if we have uh, some kind of a map, I, I used two kind of categories, like, I mean, it's not my invention, but I mean, a map is kind of useful or the image of a map or a, a view from a, from a bird's eye view. If you see the, the old Nicosia is uh, the old city, 
and maybe a small periphery around it. This, uh, the diameter of the world, the world city is one mile. So it's kind of 1,600 meters. So maybe a couple of kilometers, couple of kilometers diameter. This is what I would call the old Nicosia. And this is what we experience as old Nicosia because Uh, as we know, the Nicosia was the, the inhabitants of Nicosia were, were living within the world for many centuries, and the city started to expand at the end of the 19th century. So, if we say that we consider old Nicosia what was there 100 years ago, so this is a couple of kilometers diameter area, and then um, in, in this area. We have these administrative quarters that were used by the authorities also for some kind of administration purposes. They have their muhtar. They, they have been having their muhtar of their head of, of the quarter in a village style arrangement. Their uh, boundaries are not obvious on the ground. But then you have some centers from where the community, I mean, the community clusters are around some uh, centers. And historically, these centers, in my understanding, were the churches and the mosques. So in each mm -hmm. of these quarters, one may find a church or a mosque or both. And if you have this kind of understanding, you start to. Um, navigate in the city and mm -hmm. you try to use the urban fabric as I said as an illustration for the life of people in earlier years and it's always interesting for me I find it more interesting to talk about uh, modern history of Nicosia contemporary history and then to have uh, some flashbacks to the past um, yeah. Maria, yeah. what you've said about the churches and the mosques um, as centers of communities takes me to the to my next question, which is um, how was how did Nicosia looked at the late Ottoman era, let's say in the nineteenth uh, century? Um, what would we see if we walked around? Um, what buildings would we see? What colors would we see? What, what could we hear? Uh, maybe what could we smell? Can you walk us uh, through a bit at the late Ottoman period before the British arrived in 1878? Well, it, it, it's a very difficult thing to describe, but I will, I will give some kind of information that I found interesting. And maybe mm -hmm. there are small parts of a bigger puzzle and more complicated puzzle that is worth investigating more. We have some uh, accounts from travelers. So it's a good resource from which you can get some information about the light in Nicosia back then. One of the, one of the most uh, well-known and prominent accounts is that uh, of Luis Salvador. This guy came to Nicosia just before the change of administration. And it's very interesting to see how he describes Nicosia. He actually made some kind of a walk himself. So he was walking on the periphery of Nicosia on the walls and he was describing what he was seeing. And then he would uh, talk about some customs of the inhabitants. He also referred to some meetings he had with some notables in Nicosia. So when, when somebody reads that, when I read, or, uh, read that, I had I felt very had this impulse to do a similar work. Actually, we tried to do it one day with a group of people, and then to compare. I mean, what was he what he was describing, and then what we see now. So some interesting elements back then is that, of course, there there were uh, there were elements of the city that are similar to what we have today. And of course, change uh, differences. Um, 
one of the elements was this concept of uh, the gates close the gates closing closing and opening so you have seclusion and exclusion with this practice uh, there was a group of lepers outside of the walls begging for some uh, there were beggars lepers so it's a, a visual image that is hard to imagine nowadays at least in our society maybe somewhere else this could be the case nowadays also so you have these people who are outside of the city trying to survive the lepers and then when you enter the city from Famagusta Gate, for example, you have this experience of the bazaar, uh, the commercial area, which is another interesting element of Nicosia, the commercial arteries of Nicosia. To, to, to some extent, some of these elements survive until the mid 20th century. And then we have some new uh, concept of bazaar, and also we have the, the division of the city, which uh, imposes some other kind of boundaries. Because up until the late 19th century, the natural boundary of the city were the walls. Actually, in, in the Ottoman era, there was this practice of closing the gates and opening them. So that was a quasi natural uh, boundary of the city. And then these boundaries are transforming, uh, especially through the, the cause of the conflict. Now about the, the smell of the city. Definitely there were some smells that are, uh, maybe some of them are not familiar to us today, but then there are the smell of the products. But what I found, what I imagine, it was a much stronger, and maybe difficult for us to understand it is uh, the stench of certain uh, products like the, the tannery, because in the, the, there was a tannery at the, southwest part of the city near Bafos Gate. The tannery is uh, notorious for the for its smell because to process leather you use uh, the the sheet of animals and other material which are not very pleasant don't have a very pleasant smell and also the leather itself as it decomposes it's also I mean, it's dramatic, the smell. So that area would have a smell that we cannot imagine easily today. In our, let's say, other middle class house or yard, mm -hmm. yeah? And then you have the different materials that were for sale that also, so they have the particular odor. But also what I find very interesting, and it was an issue that we talked about with Loizos in our recent night walk, was the experience of light. Because back then, you had only, you could uh, rely on the natural sources of light, like, I don't know, the sun, the moon, the stars, and very weak uh, lamps, May I mean, our candles. So this is extremely dif dif different from what we have today because tonight the night is enlightened, I mean, literary. We have light, we have electric light, which is a, it's a big transformation in the city. Um, Maria, this takes yeah. us to the So next... imagine a city where you don't have lights ele and electricity, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, um, the, okay, yeah. Uh, this takes us actually to the next period because um, during the British uh, era, the British period, one of the things that uh, happens is that we have electricity, right? And we also have things like uh, um, post, po post office. And we mm -hmm. have 
theaters and cinemas. So um, can you tell us how the city changed both in size, but also um, within the walls um, as a structure? Um, how did the buildings change? How did the streets, streets change? How did, the, again, the smells change? Now, in the, <clears throat> from Tanzima period onwards, we have some uh, um, new liberties for the Christian populations. So we have renovation of churches, for example, mm -hmm. or expanding of churches. Then we have the improvement and expansion of schools. And then this uh, public good education is also becoming more common as the year go on. So you have people who are, uh, so I, I see this dialectic of people becoming more enlightened, more getting to know about sciences, but also acquiring a national consciousness in the contemporary sense. So they have claims over territory, they have claims for ad administrating their own affairs. So these things go together. And then within this context, we also have some activities which are supposed to be the activities that educated people could or should have, like theaters or clubs, uh, or even athletic activities, because athletic activities uh, in, in, the, in the contemporary sense is part of our education and it's something that uh, requires some kind of infrastructure. So you have uh, new infrastructures to facilitate these activities. And then of course we have new elements in commerce, but uh, yeah, and electricity, I think is a big, is a big parameter. We tend to forget about it because it take, it's taken for granted, but electricity pertains in all aspects of light. Originally it was, it was for light and then it was for appliances. And this goes well in the 20th century. And it's a transformation of the, also the housing. In earlier years, you would have these prominent buildings, mainly either religious buildings like churches and mosques or monasteries or, or houses of notables like the Archbishop or the Dragoman or the Pasha, which were constructed with stone. And then lay people, I mean, of the lower classes, they will have these mud brick houses that are so much uh, vulnerable to the elements of nature. So we have more stone, we have more stone houses, and we have a new middle class that is can afford this to build their own houses. Um, Maria, I'll come back to that uh, in relation to, you referred to the administration. So I'll come back to uh, who lived uh, um, in the, new well-built houses and who lived in the stone houses but for now let's let's move let's continue uh let's say our work in nicosia um to more modern times so how does nicosia change after the british leave what happens between 1960 um until the end of the century after, after the british left you said uh-huh so one, okay, I, I try to reflect on what I, on, on what I know or what I use in the works. Okay, so it's not a complete account of what is happening. Huh? But I see, one transformation I see is that certain buildings, uh, they have a practical use. For example, you have a church and you, because you go to pray or, a, or you have some kind of a, I don't know, market and you go there to buy and sell stuff. But older buildings, 
if there is a castle or part of a castle that is not used for defensing purposes, is uh, again vulnerable because they are, it, this material can be reused. Or if you have an old house from your grandfather and you might not need a house, but uh, a block of last now to earn more money, you don't have this consciousness that we should preserve some kind of cultural heritage. So in, in this transformation period, all their edifices, which we could consider today as elements of cultural heritage, could be easily pulled down for the sake of constructing some something that is more modern or something that is more profitable. And I think the most one of the most uh, obvious examples are the buildings which are now outside uh, Eleftheria Square, which are uh, property of uh, Mitzi School. Now they are block of flats. They are uh, elements of Cypriot modernism, but they were constructed at the sake of uh, eliminating some other buildings, which had some interest. I mean, they were of considerable beauty or interest, but they were, they were pulled down because in the 60s, you wouldn't have this notion of preserving I don't know, an older theater or a house that was constructed 50 or 100 years ago. Maria? Yes, yes. Can Asim. you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I hope the sound has been uh, interrupted. Yeah. So, yeah, we were talking about the changes after the British left. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, uh, we have this um, notion of being more modern or erecting buildings that would uh, create revenue for the owners, but not so much about preserving the character or cultural heritage of Nicosia. At the same time, uh, be just before the departure of the British and uh, shortly after them, we have the eruption of the intercommunal uh, conflict, which it was a very consequential parameter in the life of Nicosia. We have forced displacement in a larger scale. And we also have some new bind that is erected along ethnic lines. We have a different uh, concept of uh, city life because city life, uh, when the communities put forward their national demands, uh, you you tend to they tend to cluster around their own the people of their own kind in a way so this was partly imposed and partly it was imposed from the conflict so it was an individual decision so if mm -hmm. you're a turkey cypriot and you live in the southern part of the city it's not just up to you to decide where it's good for you to live you have to go to the northern part to the turkish cypriot enclave or if you're a greek cypriot you have to move south southwards to make a living. So these are uh, these dynamics. They also affect the way that the city is functioning. Uh, there are new boundaries. And I will give you this example. We have it's a very simple example. We have this market, for example, the which is called Pandobulia in Pandobulio, Pandobulia in Turkish dialect, Turkish dialect which was the central uh, market of the city. It was erected in 1932 at the side of the older, older market, which was more open and more uh, casual. So after the conflict in the 63, the, that uh, bazaar was within the Turkish Cypriot enclave. So shortly after that, the Greek Cypriot administration of the city, the mayor and the municipal council, they erected a few meters southwards, I mean, southwards of the green line back then, a new uh, public, a new municipal market, which is now again under reconstruction to become uh, to house science. 
So the city, the logic of the city is the logic, it has the logic of serving the separate communities, not one multi-communal Nicosia. Yeah. Um, Maria, so, so far we've seen the city and how it changed and also we've seen how the fabric changed. Now let's go and see in more detail the identities of people who lived in Nicosia through these periods and how their identities uh, changed. You already referred to um, the Ottoman period by making a special reference to the gates and inclusion and exclusion. You made a reference to the lepers outside the walks. You referred to the uh, bazaar. Uh, I also wanted to ask about the Khans, like the Buyuk Khan, which is not the, the only one, of course, but maybe it's the most famous. Um, also about the baths. Um, and also I wanted to ask about the clergy, um, like uh, of all religions, because as you said at the very beginning, it's a city that it's, it's full and it's uh, surrounded by uh, religious uh, centers, not just of Orthodox and uh, Muslims uh, who define the communities and the structures. So tell us a bit about what kind of people we see in the streets, maybe trading in the bazaar, in the hams, um, in the baths, um, um, about the clergy. Can you describe the, the people we see during that time? Well, again, again, it's a difficult uh, question, but I will try to refer to some of these uh, the, of the accounts of these travelers. I go back to Luis Salvador and some other people of that period, like late 19th century. And the, okay, one thing that we notice is that they refer to Muslims and Christians or even Greeks and Turks. So they could identify these big communities that they were clustering around their, their, their religion. And also about the people who were talking different languages. So you would have Turkish and Greek language. So people could have, one way of categorizing is the language they speak or the religion they, they follow. So this was one correct categorization that also people back in the days they could see and talk to talk, talk about. And then of course you would have people of different socioeconomic strata. So you have people that were more powerful or people that were living in nice houses. So these guys, uh, okay, nice houses compared to the other houses of the period. So these people, they also refer to a few notables that they could afford living in nice houses. Okay, could be like Archbishop or the Pasha or the Dragoman or some other people, some big merchants that they, 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 they were, you could distinguish them from the crowd. And also these people, they would hang to, uh, around in different places. Again, in that uh, night, what, night what we have with the Loizos, we talk about the Yeshil Casino. So it was a place where some notable powerful merchants or people who are around the Pasha were um, uh, visiting. So you also have this socioeconomic differentiation. And then you have people like the lepers uh, who are a category on their own and they are, let's say, outcasts of the society. And yeah, and back then the practice was to put them out of the city. And uh, as we know, they had also this leper's farm, which was a couple of kilometers outside of the city at the place where we have now, back, uh, later on we had the pedagogical academy and uh, the Hilton and everything. So this, the, the concept of the period is to put it people away at a certain place where they could have their own farm or village, small village. And then the other thing that uh, Luis Salvador was referring and other uh, uh, other uh, travelers was uh, black slaves. I mean, mm. this is very interesting for, I mean, nowadays to refer to these uh, categories. So they could see uh, people, uh, they could uh, call them slaves uh, of African descent. And from what we know is that indeed, yes, in the Ottoman era, you would have this practice of buying and selling people from 
of, from the outskirts of the empire, from different regions of the empire. You could also have white slaves from Crimea, but uh, in Cyprus, it was very obvious that there were these people who were brought from Sudan, Sudan by rich Cypriots, and they were serving them in their farms or elsewhere. So and these people were identifiable. And it's interesting to notice that these people, they, they are integrated in the local communities. And at some point of time, we, they became invisible. So we cannot see the, the skin of their color. And it's, it's interesting to compare this evolution of uh, these communities to in Cyprus and in other societies like, I don't know, USA, okay, it's, it's a big difference. But in Cyprus, the, uh, this is my, my approach to the subject or my understanding is that because the politicization of the communities happened along ethnic lines, the skin color was not an issue at some point. So we don't care about your skin. We care if you are Christian or Muslim or Greek or Turk, but the skin is not, is the parameter that is neutral at some point. And of course the other, uh, as we move on uh, in, in towards to the 20th century, we also have, apart from the political claims of the two main communities, which uh, distinguish them from one another, we also have the different ideologies between, I mean, the right and the left. We have the, the establishment of a communist party, and then we have trade unions. So these, these groups of people, they interact in a different way and they have a different dynamic in the city. And of course we have, when the British came here, we have the, this British elite of civil servants and administrators who again have their own life and sometimes parallel to the locals. Yeah, so in 20th, I mean, late 19th, 20th century, we have this kind of categorization of people. And within the communities, we have small Christian communities. And also we have this, um, we don't have clearly cut categories like, like we have today that Muslims should be Turkish and Turkish speakers. But as the years go on, uh, the, the people are forced to, to choose or, I don't know, to settle in a certain category that is clearly cut and is distinguishable from the others. Uh, Maria, so in, in, in a snapshot, uh, during the Ottoman period, you, you refer to um, uh, the different groups of, uh, of people. Um, what language would we hear, like in summary, if we walked around, what are the languages one would hear? From, from what I understand, I mean, this guy, is Luis Salvador, he said back then that this is before the British arrived, that uh, he, he would hear a lot of Turkish and also to, he had to use it to conduct with some uh, administrators. Uh, definitely we have Greek. And of course we have, as we know, uh, we have the Armenian communities in uh, which was quite uh, obvious in Nicosia because although it is a small community, in Nicosia there is a considerable number. And uh, so we definitely have these languages, um, like local languages. And then the travelers, I don't know, maybe fewer people would speak, let's say European languages, but this would be like either an elite or a second language for a very small minority of people. Um, yeah, I'm, but uh, this is just an estimation. Huh? Maybe this could be researched further to just to find more details about the way people would talk between them, but also between each other or according to the context. Where, mm -hmm. where are you? I mean, the bazaar, you speak this language, maybe at, at the court, you speak another language or language 
or in the fields you might be you, you will have you have let's say more uh, uh, prominent language in the countryside um, Mari, I'm gonna rush you a bit because I'm conscious of the time and I know that um, one of the nice things about our episodes is the Q&A question. So let's go to the British period. What languages do we hear during that period and how do the identities of people change? If they the, change. In the British period. Mm -hmm. In the British, okay, we have the introduction of the English language as a language of the administration. And we know that the British also uh, make, made a conscious effort to, for, 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 to create the infrastructure at schools where the prospective public servants would be educated. Like, I mean, the English school is, I mean, we have the English school being established, and also some other English speaking schools, private, were established. And this to serve the needs of the administration. Now, the local communities. Uh, well, because we are entering the modern history of Cyprus, uh, we have this uh, the census of the British administration, which indicates the categories along ethnic or linguistic lines. Most of the Muslim population were ter ethnic Turkish and uh, Turkish speaking, but not hundred percent. So we have a few Greek speaking Muslims. And then again, for the Greek Orthodox, they are mainly uh, Greek speaking. And then we have smaller Christian communities, Armenians, Catholics, and Maronites. Although Maronites are not so much within the city, but mainly in the villages. So we have this basic, the, the traditional communities of Cyprus. And then uh, with the British, uh, administration we have many British soldiers. Sometimes these soldiers, we have evidence that we have soldiers from India or other colonies. So this would be another interesting parameter in the city that you would have hundreds of soldiers sometimes or thousands of soldiers from the colonies or different areas of the empire that would come for one reason or another during the Second World War, we had some influx of soldiers. And an interesting story, I mean, it's not a, like a big community of people, but an interesting story that we have in, in an account of a journalist in the, in the context of, of the world, Second World War. We have a group of uh, female ladies dancers who are dancing in cabarets and they come from Central Europe, but although they are small in number, they affect the life of the of the capital because they attract the attention of the male population and also the I mean powerful males were or men were I don't know attracted or uh, by them, and you would have uh, people talking about them and also these ladies because they had this sense of uh, independence. They, would, they were also writing articles in newspapers. So they, 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 although they were small in number, their presence, their presence in the city was uh, obvious or uh, to some extent. Um, Maria, just to say at this point um, that when I, one of the books I was reading to prepare for the episode was um, uh, Ipayalev Kosia, the old Nicosia from Agni Mikhail Lidi, mm -hmm. which has been now um, uh, re edited and it's already sold out. Uh, I'm talking about this book. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a classic. Yeah. It's, it's a classic. I mean, um, uh, and that can mean many things, but it's it's a very good base. Like, it's, it's, it, it includes many, much information. Um, one of the things that Agnimika Lidi refers to is the um, British, the, the wives and the daughters and the British women of the time and how they start organizing balls and teas, which I imagine must have been something very um, strange for the, for the locals. So um, uh, if you came across any information, a question I have for you is, um, would locals, um, 
attend any of these? I mean, you refer to the local populations, uh, both Christians and Muslims that supported the government. And if we talk about identities, I think this is the start of an elite, right? This is where yeah. we stand and we have the formation of a new class that works for the for the crown, for the British crown. Um, so was there any interaction between, let's say, the, the British administrator and the locals besides the elites? And even with the elites, how, how big was this interaction? Was there interaction? Well, oh, from what we know, the, when the British arrived here, uh, they, they kept some distance from the local population. Uh, I don't remember where I read it, but I mean, uh, as, as a colonial power, the, I mean, the British, they would arrive at the country and uh, keep a distance from the locals and administrate them with some kind of a feeling of supremacy. Of course, Cyprus, because it was close to Europe, I mean, the locals technically they could be have been respected more than people in Africa, yeah, because they consider them to be, let's say, connected to the European culture, which was supposed to be superior in their eyes. But still, they, they had their parallel life, and gradually, few Cypriots would make it into that club, let's say, of more the middle class or even upper middle class. There were people who were working in the administration. So they were getting closer to the to the British in, in their lifestyle, but I, I suppose it was only a few people in the capital. But uh, I would say it would be a minority of people that would have everyday interaction or meaningful interaction with the British people. Now, because you, I wouldn't like to forget that. Uh, Another uh, interesting group that existed back then and it was documented were the gypsies. Was this, uh, there was this reference in a, in a tour. It was like a booklet which was talking about uh, travelers from Greece who, uh, who it, it was addressing people to come to Cyprus. So he was giving information about, the, about Cyprus. To Greek to the Greek public, so when they were when the author was writing about Nicosia, this is 1921. He talked about the different quarters of Nicosia. He gave information about the muhtars of the different quarters, and he also referred to the muhtar of the gypsies. So obviously, there was a group of people in Nicosia which was identified as gypsy, self-identified and also identified by the authorities as gypsy population, and they also had some kind of representative. So this is another interesting part of the, uh, the city, and many, maybe many, many of our uh, ancestors would refer to the traveling people that go around villages and do certain kind of jobs, and some of them were also coming and going in Nicosia. Yeah. Um, Maria, before we come to the 21st century, um, uh, one other thing I've been reading in, the, in, reading in, this, in is this book is that the, the first owners of the hotels uh, came from the near Middle East, for example, from Lebanon. Um, so there is this uh, group of people, for example, Selim Kuri from uh, Beirut and then his brother Nejim if I'm reading this correctly, who opened the Cyprus Palace. So um, uh, if I'm reading between the lines correctly, um, we do have Europeans. And at the same time, we have uh, groups of people who come from the east of, of Cyprus because, and I think it's important to highlight this because very often we see Cyprus as an extension of the of Europe. And by Europe, we mean the West, whereas mm. Cyprus is something bigger than that. I mean, um, if we see Cyprus as a, um, in a relation to the networks where people come from already, let's say from the uh, time of the um, Crusades, uh, it's not just the West. So I just wanted to highlight this and also to um, share one more information in 
1922, we have the arrival of the minor Asia refugees. So, and those people, so the, the grandfather I referred to previously, the, the owner of the Spitfire actually came from an Amur. So he was a group, he was amongst the, the refugees who came and those people either stayed in Limassol or came to Nicosia and they lived in the old quarters. So we have Turkish, but it's a different kind of Turkish because it's not the local Turkish. Um, so these people again bring their identities and their languages. And at another time, maybe you can talk more about it, about this because I did a walk last spring and I couldn't find much about them. So it's like um, they don't exist. But again, because I see the time, one thing I wanted to ask as a woman is the identities of the women. We refer to the dancers and we refer to the British uh, um, I don't know, spouses or daughters. So we see this kind of either um, the women of the upper class or the women of the lower class. What about the rest of women? Were women visible uh, in, the, in the late Ottoman period and the British period? Did they walk around the city? Did they work around the city? Um, yeah, first of all, Mariamo, what you brought up was very interesting about the different populations. And I, I don't want to be considered uh, as any kind of an expert in this, but I, actually now I found a, a nice subject for a city walk. And this could be referring to the different kind of people who were coming and going from Nicosia at a certain period, like first uh, half of 20th century. So this is what I, I consider myself more as an expert facilitator that uh, allows for voices to be heard in a city walk. So one of the very successful concepts is to have a guest star or a guest expert to talk about a particular uh, subject that is not so well known. And this could be interesting to have a walk referring to people who came to Nicosia from somewhere else. And indeed, the map is so telling. If you see the map, we are in the Eastern Mediterranean, close to Middle East. So the networks and the, the travels, it was natural to have these networks in the Middle East. So you would have people going to Beirut, studying or buying and selling, or Alexandria, or uh, Asia Minor. So these are the, let's say, historical, natural uh, areas from where Cypriots would get people, information, goods, stuff like that. And then I think our uh, inclination towards Western Europe nowadays is a recent phenomenon in a way. It's quite a recent, chronologically speaking, that we have our center, uh, Brussels. I mean, back in the days, you would have other centers of interaction in the closer to the area. Now about women, about women. It's another big issue and I'm very happy that uh, recently we have seen some groups and you might know them, that they organize some city walks and they have their focus, the uh, life of women. It was, I think, Pogo and some other researchers uh, some girls, and they had the, they did a very good work uh, organizing walks in Nicosia, highlighting the the existence and the interaction and the life of women in Nicosia, and they also have some published material where you could see women engaged into trade or in education or in the national struggles, because sometimes we, what we say is national struggle, is a, it's also a liberating power for women, because if a woman uh, back in the days where the communities would have their national ambitions, if you are a protagonist in this effort to educate your community, then you are also emancipated. I mean, you have your own 
power within the community as a woman. Now, the way I, 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 I okay, this is, this could be like, uh, not so well researched, but I would see, I would see three kind, three, three clusters of women engaging in social life in Nicosia. You would have people of, of the house. So people, women that would may, maybe they have, they come from an affluent family and they stay at home. They are engaged in, uh, in the production, I don't know, for household materials. They could be educated and their skin is kind of white because they don't go out in the sun too much. So you could identify them as women of some kind of upper class. And then you had women, women of the fields. So these are women who go, they are engaged into agricultural activities and their uh, skin is hardened and they are, maybe they are darker because of the sunlight. So this, they, they, could, uh, they could be also pioneers in agricultural life, but maybe they, they, are, they have a harder life because they have to work in the fields, but also take care of the family, of the kids. And then you will have women in the streets. So this is, these are women who are buying and selling. They could be powerful women they, and they have to deal with men in the streets also. And in this category, we could also include the women who are engaged in this, uh, okay, in prostitution, which is the, the life of the street. So, in these areas of, of, of life. And then we have a very small amount of women in, in more recent years that will be more engaged into political life, yeah? So they will be pioneers and also be uh, elected in some kind of bodies or make clubs that uh, would pursue some uh, political agenda. So these, these uh, groups of women, the, you can see them engage in public, public life to some extent. And according to the period or the, or the, or, or the space where you try to research, you will have a, a different presence of these women. Um, Maria, to, to bring this to a close and allow some time for Q&A because uh, you have also warned me that at nine o'clock you start uh, being hungry it's and I, I empathize with you in that. Um, yeah. My next two questions, which I, I think we can leave for the Q&A if there is space, um, have to do with the what we call in history, teaching and learning the know-how. How do we know the things we know? So I wanted to talk a bit about the sources you have been using and the advantages and disadvantages of those sources, maybe their limitations. I mean, this could be another episode, but um, I think it's worth just highlighting that what we've been discussing today comes from the sources that we have access to, the languages we have access to, our positionalities, mm -hmm. our interests. Um, to wrap this up, um, I have two questions for you and they are interrelated. So one of them is, let's come to the 21st century. Let's come to now, the now of your works. Uh, how did the identities change in summary? Who are the people we can see in the old quarters? We, we've called this episode, Old Quarters, New Lives, and this can be read um, in many ways, but I guess it has special significance um, nowadays, especially with developments, let's say, with the Parthenagogy uh, and this Phanerogenes. Um, mm -hmm. So one question is 21st century. What are the identities of people? How have they changed uh, very quickly? And the last question is, as a researcher, always when we research something, our own identity changes as well. So uh, how, if, if your identity has changed through these works and through your own research, how has it changed? In what ways? Okay. Again, very nice questions. I will refer a bit to these identities with two examples. I will, I will not try to make a theory out of it. I will give two examples. Let's talk about the Barcelona of Yofane Romanis, which was established there, and it was the the center of Greek education for women. 
in Nicosia. And uh, in the course of the years, at some point, uh, first it was for girls, later it became mixed. And then we have this turning point in the 1980s, Cyprus, uh, until 1980s, it was an exporter of migrants. And from 1980s onwards, we are becoming a, a receiver of migrants. More or less, you can see the statistics. So we have this gradual transformation. So Parthena, what you find in is two years ago, before it was closed, it was a mixed school. It was primary and secondary school. And the kids were if I'm not mistaken, 100% of migrant background. And you will find people coming from 19 countries. So you see how dramatic is the change in the, in the, in the population of an area in the course of, I don't know, two generations. And if you put in this transformation, the, displace, the local displacement, the influx of, and the influx of migrants, you see a dramatic change in the, in the population of Nicosia and the identities of Nicosia. And then one could easily see, uh, for example, uh, in different courses of Nicosia now, you have people, you have students, thousands of students from various backgrounds. We have asylum seekers, you have refugees. So I don't know if somebody could map the population so dynamic that people come and go, and sometimes it's so fast that you can't even document it. I'm talking about the whole city of Nicosia, and I don't know if anybody can have a clear statistic, like, like the census that the British did 140 years ago, where they counted like with big accuracy the number of the inhabitants, if it's even possible to do this today. Now, the other transformation that I see is that we have, Okay, we have this reifying of the, of the ethnic identities of the big communities, the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots. We also have the history of confrontation, which uh, consolidates the identities and makes them more rigid. But nowadays we see some kind of a return to the, some kind of Cypriotism. And this Cypriotism is expressed in different ways. Part of it is having this more blur identity, ethnically speaking. So you are open to have more hybrid identity. And then the other element of this identity, you differentiate yourself from the, the so-called motherlands, Greece and Turkey, and you say, we are here and we are the Cypriots and we have elements, I don't know, of Greek heritage or Turkish heritage but we are something different. And we, we, we see this being, being expressed in different forms. And I would like to refer to this, uh, the band that we all know, Monsieur Domani. And I think this is an illustration, a cultural illustration of this shift of identity that we have a band that is uh, informed by the, let's say, Cypriot heritage and they make an international career without having to have a stepping stone in either uh, mainland or ma motherland. They just go from Cyprus to the world and they convey with them consciously a kind of Cypriotism that is inclusive, not only of the traditional communities of, ne of Nicosia or Cyprus, but also is welcoming to the newcomers in the island. So this, this, is a, this is again one big dynamic and you can see it, it's obvious in Nicosia. There are places where people like this hang around, they have their coffee and they interact and uh, they claim, the, they claim uh, the territory of Nicosia with their presence and their code of contact. Their graffiti, I don't know, their music, the, the way they talk, and whatever. I mean, yeah. Um, and last but not least, very quickly before we go to the QA, uh, transformations of identities. Uh, what about your identity? Well, my identity, yeah, yeah. 
sometimes we are not uh, it's difficult to talk about our own identity uh, because we experience ourselves every day so maybe some a third person it's better to have a third person talking about us as we change our i don't know identity but i would say <laughs> part of my identity now is being seen as this guy who organizes Ecosia work. So what does this mean for me? It means that I also become an item of this work. And this work is, again, uh, this, uh, there is this agony to understand better Nicosia, but also to have, what do we say I'm, I'm from Nicosia, to realize that I represent many different versions of Nicosians and not, I mean, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm more aware that you cannot easily talk on behalf of Nicosia if you are stick with the identity that you, I don't know, had when you were know, 15 years old or 20 years old. Yeah? Um. Maria, thank you. Yeah, so, so it's like being more conscious about how diverse is the Nicosia. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Um, let's take some questions. I hope you would give us like 10 extra minutes. Yeah, sure. Um, so before we move to the QA, um, I would very quickly say that uh, to our friends who are with us now, that what you are seeing is the effort of many people so except from myself there is a group working for uh, uh, Barges and I would like to make a very brief uh, reference very quick to the people who worked uh, to make this happen for the last two years in random order is the Desiree Birinci, Sofia Kirillu, Emily Dimitriou, Rachel Kumbaru, Manos Rahimis, Maria Costandinidou, Nicolas Karajas, Lambros Asbestas. I would like to make special reference to the editors of Barges uh, who are the people who flesh out the topics, the questions, who flag out different interpretations of a topic, um, who highlight issues like uh, sources, different sources. So again, uh, these editors are Dr. Loizos Capsalis. This is the Loizos Marios kept uh, making reference to. Uh, Obchan Hildirim Turk. Obchan will be the host of our December episode, which I will announce uh, at the end of this uh, episode, uh, Nur Chetimer, Evrenzel Sebeb, and, and myself, Maria Georgiou. Um, I would also, again, like to remind you about the reflection pieces. Um, if this episode and its Q&A, because we are not done yet, um, sparked something, new questions, new interpretations, like um, new ideas, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you, and I would love you to write something for us. Um, donations. Uh, we are an independent body and we've done this very consciously so as to have the freedom to uh, do history independently. So if you would like to support what we do, and this is not about us getting paid, uh, we would like to do more physical events as I highlighted before, like do these things live with a live audience. So we would like to buy equipment and buy to you. This is one of the expenses we need to do. So if you would like to support this, uh, please let us know through our social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram. Um, how do you do a how do you do a question? You can either write Q, capital Q in the chat because I'm afraid I cannot see the hands. Um, so either please do write Q and I'll understand that you want to make a question in person. or um, if you would prefer not to make the question in person, Please write the question in the chat and I'll make it uh, for you. So I'll switch off my camera to, to be faster with the questions. So um, Okay, and until we have uh, questions here, um, so we have a few comments here. Um, uh, one of them is a comment about analysis because you referred Maria to Luis Salvador. So there is also mm -hmm. a comment from Stelios for Emil Deschamps 
who has a good analysis on the city in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, so just send me a picture of the of the book before it's uh, also let's say classic one in Cyprus, the land of Aphrodite. Mm -hmm. um, and there is also a reference from Okjan says for those who are interested in statistical knowledge about the population of Nicosia during the late Ottoman era, there is a recently published work in two volumes uh, and he has the link here. This is by Evangelia Balta. And I believe that if I'm not mistaken, this is Desiree Birinci who would like to uh, make a, a question. Please open your microphone and, and shoot. Hello. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you to uh, Bachis for this episode and also to Marios for this really interesting and engaging talk. I love Nicosia, so it was really like nice to hear about all these um, perspectives on how it was before I lived here. <laughs> uh, very interesting. Um, my question is, um, so it's about uh, Nicosia Walled City in its current context. Um, I've often heard some people uh, you know, in amongst the crashed hopes of a united Cyprus, people uh, usually in a jokingly way say um, we could have a united Nicosia in the walled town and the rest of Cyprus can stay divided, but let's have our united Nicosia so that we can um, live as one in the old town. And ironically, obviously, Nicosia was the first city to get the, well, the, the first division. But now with the checkpoints, the three checkpoints, if we go outside the old town as well, there's a lot of interaction. It's the city with the most interaction um, in Cyprus between the two sides. So uh, I noticed you said at one point about the markets and how um, the two sides of Nicosia had sort of grown to serve uh, each side sort of grown separately, if I understood correctly your point. Um, and I was just wondering if you think now the opposite is happening, uh, like what your view is on, on Nicosia now, if it's especially the walled town, if uh, in the past 12 years that you've been doing the walks, how much you've seen the two sides grow closer together or... Um, Maybe even uh, if you think a united Nicosia walled town would be possible, <laughs> uh, not necessarily politically, because that's not down to us, I think, to an extent, but spatially, do you think that would be a possibility? Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, Desiree, thank you for the nice words, first of all. Uh, okay, I, I will comment on your ideas. Um, I, I would say one of the, um, co economically speaking, I don't have the data to to be sure to what extent there is interconnection, but um, unfortunately, the strings that take put people together financially are quite weak from what I gather. They are based on individual actions, but then because of the political context, we cannot see big corporations being established in the economic area. But what I see, and it's an obvious change because of the opening of the checkpoints, it is that there are some hubs in Nicosia where there is social interaction action of people who share some and have some shared values and, and I think this is the most uh, powerful way of being together is the shared values and also the possibility to share the space because we have this possibility to move across the divide nowadays especially in Nicosia now I, can, I cannot uh, uh, ignore the, the example of the home for cooperation with which I'm kind of also attached sentimentally and also in other ways, because the Home for Cooperation is one of the few examples that is a sustainable way 
uh, of uh, having people together in uh, high uh, of a space being managed cooperatively because if you have if you okay it's important to feel welcome at different spaces in Nicosia no matter who you are but there are very few opportunities to co-manage a space now okay here we have this virtual co-management which is very good but in physical spaces this opportunity is limited because of the political context so in that respect the hopeful cooperation is a very good example of how an area or a physical area but also it's also a conceptual area can be co-managed with a certain amount of effort or a certain amount of goodwill or a big amount of goodwill and also uh, it can educate people because it's a matter of being educated on how to co-manage and live together for people and communities who have experienced conflict you have to be to learn how to to practice this and to learn from your practice and to uh, uh, make it work better so this area like a corporate cooperation I, I, I see it's a very powerful example of a microbus which can be managed now if you ask me if Nicosia as, a, as an area could have the same way of being managed well i i would hope so but i, I don't think it's possible in the current in the current political context because there are many other elements that prevent it from happening but what i see that is possible and could be a force of maybe further development is the creation of communities of people with shared values and and uh, ways of being of, of connecting with the city that are moving around within this political framework and creating some kind of pressure of further interaction or i don't know something that we cannot predict now in this uh, discussion but could be made possible in in a few years so we need this population to support any opportunity that will arise for closer cooperation. Thank you, Marius. Um, yeah, the, the the issue of the values is something I hadn't actually accentuated in my mind myself. So yeah, I really appreciate that. I think you're definitely right. Thank you. Um, any other comments, questions? Um, Ezra says, let me read her comment. Thank you, Marius, for sharing your time and to back just for organizing this virtual walk talk. You covered a lot in a short amount, which gave us a great bird's eye view of the city over a stretch of time. I wonder if Marius can briefly comment on how public squares function have changed from the Ottoman time to the current uh, day. Um, this is a brilliant question and it's actually one we started discussing in one of our um, other episodes, specifically the hybrid episode uh, we did with uh, Elena Barpa, uh, public spaces and how the public spaces define, define our identities. Um, Loisus, I do apologize, I, I, I miss your uh, question, so let's give the the floor to, to Ezra, so, and I'll come back to you, Loisus. Um, so, Marie, uh, can you briefly comment on how public squares function have changed from the Ottoman time to the current day? From what I understand and from what I know, public life in the Ottoman era was quite different from what we experience today. And also the use of public space was quite different. And and generally society was more there, there was more seclusion so people i mean family life or was more introvert so you wouldn't have this notion of like a big public space where people would interact or claim i don't know have some political claims stuff like that and we see this happening gradually during the british administration 
and we have two kind of big two kind of big public gatherings one of them is is referring to the national demands of the communities and this is a very powerful way of uh, engaging people in i don't know demonstrations and rallies and public gatherings and also the other way of uh, bringing people together was for social demands. And this was happening, I mean, there was a peak in the 40s with the trade unions and the left-wing movement, bringing people together to claim social rights. Yeah, and then we have this, uh, the era of the big gatherings of the political leaders, uh, which was, uh, I mean, uh, okay, Macarius was like an outstanding figure in the 20th century, bring big people together is like a politician rock star that would uh, seduce people with his words. But this is a, a way of gathering that is from that period. This is mid 20th century, which faded away in the 80s, 90s. So there is no public figure that would make people come together in such big numbers and so in with so much passion and uh, another maybe Turkish Cypriot leaders but that, that of that period of that period and then we have again political demonstrations or gatherings uh, especially within the Turkish Cypriot community uh, for uh, before the Anand clan which was uh, there were remarkable gatherings in particular public areas. And then we have, I mean, nowadays we have smaller gatherings of more diverse groups. We have different kinds of claims or uh, goals. And uh, this is more, uh, let's say more, uh, more colorful, but of bigger scale gatherings in public spaces. And this, I refer to more to political kind of gatherings, not so much about, I don't know, commercial, like a, we have like uh, this uh, concept of panairi or I don't know, buying and selling, but you would have this kind of markets of buying and selling animals, for example, in Kairinia Gay. But this is, let's say, a more commercial way of having people interacting in a public space. Uh, thank you, Marios. Um... I believe that Loisos has a question. Loisos, would you like to take the floor? Sure, I wanted to ask Marios, what are the ingredients for a good educational walk of Nicosia? And also if you have any memorable or favorite walks that you can share with us. Okay, yes, definitely. From this empirical, empirical research that I did, um, the, the, the ingredients of uh, good walk is to have an element of fun in it, okay? So this is number one. So sometimes when I start the book, I say, I will try to be accurate and interesting, but I have, if I have to choose, I will choose to be interesting. But okay, I try to be honest and accurate also when I say about something, yeah? So the, the idea is to make this activity so uh, there are three parameters that I find people uh, alike. One of it is like interesting, I don't know, inf information sharing, yeah? Opportunity to interact because there is a strong element of interaction within, within these walks, in the, in the walks. Um, and also uh, I, I would say, um, the choice of the subject or of the route to have to bring to light something that is either not so well known or passes unnoticed. So it will have this element of surprise in it. Yeah. Now I have, to, to be honest, I have many remarkable experience and memories from these walks. Um, in the beginning, I would do this more, let's say classic walk with some basic information and some landmarks. And then the other big chapter was the introduction of these guest speakers uh, or uh, theme words. 
Okay, I can remember very well a, a book about uh, the schools of Nicosia. Okay, some schools of Nicosia we did with teacher trade unions with my colleague Suleiman de Rener, who is a teacher also. We did something, it was also interesting for us because uh, we had to research and find out about schools that don't exist anymore because most of the schools, many schools, tens of schools existed in the old Nicosia. And now I don't know if any of them are alive. I mean, Fanny Romani was one of the last ones. We have I a couple of, I don't know, we have, I don't know, five, six schools. We used to have 50 schools in Nicosia. So you dig your research, you find schools. And so interesting also for us, but also to share it. Uh, so schools of Nicosia, we also have uh, these night walks. People are crazy about them because there is this ambience of the night, which uh, is more um, people they have this uh, extra energy. We can also have a drink for the people who drink. Oh, on the way, we also interact with people who have their premises functioning nowadays. So they give the contemporary account. Imagine visiting a place, giving a historical account about that place, and then you have the owner, it's a taverna now. And the owner talks about the new concept of things and how he works and how he welcomes people. And um, yeah, so there are so many interesting subjects. So the same material, I mean, this city can be illuminated in a different way. So it will bring to the foreground other elements. It could be the schools, it could be the life of women. It could be the buildings of certain period. It could be the, the religious establishments. It could be the groups, the clubs, which function in Nicosia in different areas or eras, yeah? And I will share this and I don't know, this is was something that struck me. We had this walk one day and we had this girl, Cypriot girl, educated. She finished university, came back and said, Marius, when I used to say uh, Cypriot, I actually meant uh, Greek Cypriots. So now I realize that in this city, there are so many other elements. So when I talk about Nicosia, the Cypriots of Nicosia, in my mind, is not just the Greek Cypriots of Nicosia or the, you know? So this is, is a shift in our mindset. And this is also something that I experience. That I talk about Nicosia in a more conscious way, uh, having this more, inclusive approach to what it means to be a Nicosian or what it means to talk about Nicosia. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And this goes back to the, I guess, Marius, to my last question about how we are uh, transformed through these experiences, uh, both of research and existing within the space. I've seen a couple of uh, comments and I'm aware of the of the time, so um, Ferea, Ferea is a filmmaker, so she she, she raises this, uh, um, she reminds us of the movie called Smuggling Hendrix, uh, directed okay. by Marios Piperidis. I, I, I'm sure that many of us have seen it. So this is a story Ferea reminds us about a man who loses his dog at the buffer zone that separates the Greek South from the Turkish North uh, and the man tries to bring with him the, the dog back to the Greek uh, South and uh, while facing a number of uh, challenges. So um, Ferea says, Marklin Hendricks gives us a vivid demonstration of how the fences we built, both real and imagined between ourselves and others can be broken down once we recognize familiarity in the face of the unknown. Ferea, absolutely, uh, I think this is a, a very good example of how we are um, uh, defined by space and how we are defined by um, walls and what we do with them. Um, there is a, a comment by Desire. Interestingly, French school was one of them in the 20th century. I'm, I've, I've lost the thread a bit. I'm not sure what she refers to. 
Uh, she refers to the one of the schools of Nicosia. Ah, okay, yes. When you yeah. when you were talking about the work you did with uh, Suleiman, so um, yes, so it was one historical school, yeah. Um, I know it's nine ten, so I would like to bring this to a close by. Um, of course, thanking Marius. Maria, it was a pleasure to have you with us for the for the launch of Bakhtes Histories of Cyprus 2022-23. Uh, I think it made um, a, a very interesting and stimulating start. So thank you so much for sharing your experience and uh, your experiences and your works uh, with us uh, virtually. I would like to thank everyone in the audience uh, for your presence, for your comments, for your questions, for your support. Um, we are looking to see you in our next episode or event. Um, stay tuned for this. So our next confirmed episode will be, uh, I will read this um, with one of our editors as host, Okchan Yildirim Turk. Um, hosting Serkan Karas, and they will discuss together the technopolitics and history of colonial infrastructure in Cyprus under the British rule, bringing together the material dimension, such as harbors and railways, uh, and also the socio-political dimension, such as the British imperial politics. To put this in a nutshell, in a sentence, harbors, railways, electric lines, the history of technopolitics in Cyprus under British colonial rule. This is taking place on the 14th of December, about the same time. We are also planning to have another um, episode in November. Uh, just to tease out, uh, this year we are also planning to do um, an episode on migration, at least one, and at least one episode on art history. So stay tuned. Please follow us on social media on our Facebook or Instagram, or if you don't have social media, you can find our uh, website and send us uh, an email. Um, again, Maria, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Maria. Keep up the good work with Bakshe. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. And see you soon. See you, yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.